Welcome to Shattering Myths, the program devoted to those of you who have come to realize that the world's religious, political, economic, and military institutions are corrupt, even counterproductive. I am Yada. If you'd like to join us any time over the next two hours, our number is toll-free, 877-300-7645. We tried to cover this story several days ago and just never got very deep into it, but I'd like to read some excerpts of the report this by Reuters of what occurred in Cleveland. A Cleveland police officer was found not guilty on Saturday in the shooting death of an unarmed black man and woman after a high-speed car chase in 2012 was one of a series of cases that have raised questions over police conduct and race relations in the United States. Imposal, also known as Judge John O'Connell, said Officer Michael Relo, 31, acted reasonably. <laughs> oh, I despise this man. Acted reasonably in shooting the two suspects while standing on their hood of their surrounded car and firing multiple rounds, 15 if you're counting, through their windshield at point-blank range. Brillo, who was among a group of officers who fired on the car, was found not guilty of voluntary manslaughter and of aggravated assault. You know, when you stand on a car, now you're... The car is, is stopped. It is surrounded by uh, other police officers. The two occupants in the car are unarmed. They have done nothing wrong. They're now surrounded by a score or more of police cars, all of which have their weapons drawn. They've had at least 100 bullets fired into their car. And this man, then when they are absolutely isolated, Mind you, they're unarmed and trapped in a parking lot with nowhere to go, jumps up on the hood of their car and unloads his pistol. Fifteen rounds, point-blank range, looking right at them. And he is found not guilty of aggravated assault and manslaughter. I don't know what is manslaughter today. What would you have to do to be more aggravated in your assault than standing on the hood of a car and firing 15 rounds at point-blank range into a man and a woman who have done nothing wrong and who are unarmed? I mean, I, how could you say that was not aggravated assault? How can you not say it was manslaughter? Now, what the judge said is is that there is no way to prove that this man, this cop, killed them. No, fifth, shooting 15 rounds into the car, that may not have been what killed them. No, he said, you know, because other cops were shooting at them, that it might have been one of the other cops' bullets that killed them. Well, if that's the case... How did they drive their car into this parking lot if they were already dead? I mean, this judge has got to be either the dumbest human being to have ever graduated from law school, the most immoral, irrational individual to have ever graduated from law school, or he is nothing but a tool of those who would empower the police and the government to take away not only all of your rights, but your very life. The chase, which started in downtown Cleveland after reports of gunfire coming from the car, went through multiple cities at speeds topping 90 miles an hour and ended with 13 Cleveland police officers firing 137 rounds. Yes, these cops chased this couple at speeds topping 90 miles an hour with 13 police officers firing 137 rounds, all because some idiot thought 
thought that he heard gunfire. Yeah, how about 137 shots of gunfire? The couple was unarmed. They never fired a shot. The idiot police officer mistook the sound of, of a backfiring car somewhere in that neighborhood as gunfire. And so he went ballistic. And then he began to, to chase them. And then he began to endanger others by chasing them at ever higher speed. And if you're this man and woman in the car, what are you going to do when men that you know would kill you and be exonerated or chasing you at high speed when they pull their guns out and are shooting at your car. What are you going to do? Are you going to pull over and say, oh, yeah, please, shoot me? This couple did nothing wrong. They didn't have a gun. There was no gunshots fired. And yet you've got 13 police officers chasing them at 100 miles an hour, 90 to be more exact, endangering Everyone in that community firing 137 rounds at them with this idiot at the end jumping on the hood of their car, which is now trapped in a parking lot with all the other police cars around it, and he unloads his revolver at this couple who have done nothing wrong. And it's not aggravated assault, and it's not manslaughter. Folks, you're in a system where your life is meaningless. It can be taken by the government at any moment. You don't have to have committed a crime. <sighs> Russell was struck 24 times. That was the man's name. And uh, Melissa Williams, uh, so it's Russell Williams and Melissa Williams, she was struck 23 times. Well, 137 rounds, and uh, 47 of them, about a third of them, hit their intended targets, this man and this woman. And they were, you know, uh, you can't call it, claim that they were sexist. They hit the man 24 times, and the woman, his wife, 23 times. That means that two-thirds of the shots went astray, but they successfully put... 47 bullets into this husband and wife. But that's not aggravated assault. It's not manslaughter. The judge found Brillo, who had climbed on the car's hood after it had been cornered by other patrol cars, had acted reasonably and his belief that the suspects were shooting at him and other officers. How could you act reasonably when they didn't have a gun, when they never shot once? How can that be reasonable? This from a different perspective, a different article. Go ahead, Scott. You said it yourself. Only one-third of the bullets hit their target. So the cops are shooting at each other. <laughs> I mean, correct. That's correct. <laughs> the cops created this calamity. And the reason they thought there was gunfire is they were shooting. Yeah. So it's actually highly possible that that guy actually thought they were shooting at him. <laughs> I mean, if, if they shoot, if they only hit 47 of them, and I'm sure some more hit the car or whatever, but... I mean, yeah. something's got to be Well, the windshield would have been, uh, you know, smashed to smithereens, and, you know, that's... Uh, yeah, oh something's got to go astray. So, I mean, he was being shot at yeah. by his own guy. <laughs> in Cleveland, this is a different article. A Cleveland police officer was acquitted Saturday for his role in a 22 fatal shooting of two unarmed people in a car after officers mistook the sound of the car backfiring his gunshots. After a four-week trial, a judge found Michael Relo, 31, not guilty of two counts of felony voluntary manslaughter in the deaths of uh, Timothy Russell, 43, and Melissa Williams, uh, 30. Russell and Williams were killed on November 29, 2012, after they led 62 police vehicles on a chase across Cleveland. They were outnumbered at the end by, what, 13 to 1, according to that one report. 
but they had 62 police vehicles following them, chasing them at high speed, shooting at them. 62. You think that's maybe a, on the overreaction scale, where would you put 62 police officers chasing at 90 miles an hour a couple who had done nothing wrong at high speed through all of these neighborhoods and firing 137 shots into their car, striking them a total of 47 times on the level of proper response to a car backfiring? Where would you put that? They make a scale that you could put how over reactive they were. That's the whole attitude of police. Shoot first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, all the way to forty three times before you ask any questions. Shoot Tamir Rice. Fill his young thirteen year old body with bullets. Oh, and then maybe you could ask him. Hey, is that a toy gun, kid? Yeah, that's the new mentality of America's national military. Shoot first, second, third, fourth, fifth. Continue to shoot. Don't shoot to wound. Don't shoot to capacitate. Don't just threaten to shoot. Shoot. Shoot over and over and over again. Kill innocent people. Oh, the judge won't hold you accountable. The Justice Department won't find you guilty. You can consider it target practice. That's not aggravated assault. I mean, come on. It's not manslaughter. The state did not prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, Michael Brillo, knowingly caused the deaths of Timothy Russell and Melissa Williams, because the essential element of causation was not proved by both counts, said uh, John P. O'Donnell in his ruling. Did not knowingly cause the deaths of Timothy. Hey, Scott, if at point blank range you fire 15 rounds, eight into my body from a foot away, eight into my wife's body from a foot away, would you knowingly be causing harm to me? The judge here, Judge John P. O'Donnell, in his ruling, saying that the state did not prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, Officer Michael Brillo, knowingly caused the deaths of Timothy and Melissa Williams. He had a 10-millimeter pistol. From the end of his pistol to the upper torso and head of the two individuals he murdered. There wasn't more than a foot and a half, maybe two feet. One 10 millimeter bullet to the head will be fatal 100% of the time. One 10 millimeter bullet to your upper chest region will be fatal 100% of the time. One. He had 15 rounds that he fired. Seven into the man, eight into the woman. And this judge said that the state did not prove that he knowingly caused their deaths. Gee, what was he trying to do? Tickle them? What was he trying to do? Decorate them for Halloween? What was he trying to do? Uh, raise the mortician's bill so that, that it would cost a fortune to bury them? What was he trying to do? To eliminate the need for, for cremation because they were already in, in little pieces? What do you think he was trying to do, Judge? What do you think that a cop with a 10 millimeter firearm at point blank range firing into two people's heads and upper torsos is thinking is going to be the consequence of those shots? And when he stood on the damn hood of the car, if either of these two individuals had a gun, 
Wouldn't that have been the dumbest thing this man could have done? If he thought that these couple were still firing at him, wouldn't he have sought the protection of his car and fired at them behind his car? What kind of a moron, if he's actually being fired on, if he actually thinks that somebody is sitting in a car firing at him with a pistol, would jump on the hood of the car so that his torso was within two feet of them? I mean, how can you be so stupid? I don't think you can be so stupid. So the issue here is not stupidity. It's a completely broken moral compass, an inability to be sensible. Oh, and of course, the community in Cleveland marched in protest. And the police said, nope, that's unlawful behavior. And they arrested those who protested what this judge and these officers had done. Welcome to America. You know, it's why a man living in Australia said he would never come to America. This is a thoughtful individual. So I would never come to America. It's way too dangerous. Your police are overly belligerent. Brillo, a 17-year veteran, is the first of six Cleveland officers to be prosecuted in the fatal shooting. Five police superiors, none of whom had fired shots, each faced misdemeanor counts alleging dereliction of duty. When uh, Russell uh, Chevrolet Malibu finally came to a stop in East Cleveland, 13 officers opened fire. Those 13 officers shot 137 rounds into the vehicle. Brillo, prosecutor said, was the only one who continued to shoot after the threat, which never existed, was obviously over. He climbed onto the hood of the Malibu, boy, yeah, he's Rambo, and shot another 15 rounds, striking Wilson, who was driving, and his wife, who was in the passenger seat. O'Donnell spent uh, nearly 15 minutes explaining his decision in the, uh, the trial. He walked through the conflicting forensic testimony. Yeah, conflicting forensic testimony. You shoot 137 bullets into a vehicle. You have 47 of them at close range. Strike two individuals. And then you have another man. Shoot. Another 15 shots at point-blank range. And you don't expect that the forensic evidence is going to be a little garbled? That maybe that the, the effect of one shot is going to somehow hamper your ability to know the effect of a previous shot? I do want to comment because it uh, really irritates me uh, that the GCN promotes such uh, snake oil. But the George Nori, who is the host of uh, Coast to Coast, I, and not the brightest tool in the shed, I did a three-hour interview with George Nori on Coast to Coast uh, years ago. George Norrie is now uh, selling his soul to the devil to endorse uh, the third iteration of what was once longevity. Longevity was a pyramid scheme on an herbal concoction with a, uh, a veterinarian masquerading as an MD. Uh, the, and this man's history is, uh, is really reprehensible. When uh, enough people got on to the scam that was longevity, they changed the name to Youngevity, hoping that no one would be the wiser and they could start their scam all over again. But now, you see, they're not even calling it Youngevity. I said, I'm not going to do this show if you're going to run Youngevity ads on this program. And so, well, now they have a different name for it. Maybe they're hoping that people are dumb enough that they won't pay any attention to all of the malfeasance that was promoted twice before. Don't do it, folks. Don't believe the scam or scam artists. Now, we talked about the belligerence uh, being perpetrated by U.S. police and how uh, they 
had uh, 60 vehicles in pursuit of of an unarmed car when the couple inside the car had done nothing wrong and ultimately fired 130 some odd rounds into the car and uh, with the final blow being a officer on the hood unloading his 10 millimeter pistol into them at point blank range and the judge exonerating the man who had done so not capable of being moral, not capable of being rash, rational, not even capable of being just. And you have a judiciary in America that's as corrupt as its national police force, is overreactive, is ridiculous. It's a nation where your life doesn't mean anything anymore. Your freedom means nothing anymore. Your education means nothing anymore. And as Roy pointed out yesterday, soon your, your money will mean nothing anymore. Well, it's not the only place that has bottomed out in terms of morality and hostility with, with crimes far worse than humanity has ever endured. There's another place. That's the place of Islam. I'm going to read a story to you. This was presented by CNN. A boy in a black knit cap stands in front of a man who is bound, both hands behind his back and at the feet. He locks eyes on the captive, his gaze seizing with anger. The boy lifts a pistol and he shoots the man in the forehead. The boy is a jihadist for the Islamic State, and he's not the only one. This is the Sunni extremists, they're not extremists, the Sunni fundamentalists of the Islamic State appear to be brainwashing an entire generation to create an army of impressionable young soldiers. That is not the act of a soldier. When you kill at point-blank range, an individual that you do not know, who committed no crime, who was not firing at you, who is bound on his knees before you and you blow out his brains, you are not a soldier. And if we're going to speak of religion brainwashing, then everyone in this world has been brainwashed, either in academia with socialist secular humanism and political correctness, or in their mosque, their church, or other shrine with some religion. But do not think for a moment that the leaders of the Islamic State told this individual anything other than what is known about Muhammad. What is stated in the Quran and Hadith. The lure or kidnap of children is common, and then they train them to fight. They actually train them to be good Muslims. They force some children to give blood to injured soldiers or to spy for them, and others they force to whip prisoners, human rights groups say. Yes, if, if you can do what America sought to do with its military, which is devalue human life, to create the impression that others do not have a right to live. Where, you know, the American sniper, the man that has more kills than anybody else in the U.S. military before he was himself killed, not in battle, but by a friend. If you can create what he did, where he says, you know, I'll stand before my maker and justify every one of those shots, every one I killed, every pull of the trigger. Why? Because he was indoctrinated by the U.S. Armed Forces to devalue human life, to view it good to kill those he did not know, those that had up to that point not committed a crime. It's okay. They weren't opposing military. This wasn't a, an all-out war. He's not fighting somebody in uniform where a country is trying to invade his and he's trying to prevent them from doing so. No, he's over in somebody else's country and not engaged against the military. 
but he thinks it's okay to take their lives because that's what he's been indoctrinated to think. That's what Muslims are indoctrinated to think. They devalue life. And they value cruelty and value death. Their plight, this article says, raises questions that defy simple answers. No. They neither raise questions nor are the answers difficult. What future awaits these children if the Islamic State is ever to be defeated? How can you defeat the Islamic State? It's Islam. Are you going to defeat a religion of 1.5 billion people? How would you defeat it? Do you think there's enough bullets? Are there enough bombs to defeat a religion of 1.5 billion people? I don't think so. I don't think you can defeat a religion. You can expose it. You can condemn it. You can isolate it. You can exterminate the rubbish that is preached by that religion by exposing it, by condemning it, by proving that it is wrong. You can remove those infected by such deadly and hostile, destructive and deceitful religions from your midst so that they don't infect others. In fact, the single most compassionate thing you can do is to rid your country of those infected by this religion. It's by far the most compassionate thing you can do. This article goes on to say, the future awaits, what future awaits these children? Can anything be done to help them recover from the scars of war? Or will Iraq and Syria face the prospect of a lost generation paralyzed by the memories of the atrocities of their youth? That's not the scars of war. It has nothing to do with the scars of war. The scar, the malignancy, is the doctrine upon which they are being indoctrinated. It's Islam. That is what has scarred them. That is what has destroyed their conscience to the point that they're not capable of exercising moral judgment. So long as Islam is in them, their fate is irresolvable, unrecoverable. It has nothing to do with war. It has all to do with the doctrine that devalues life, that celebrates death, that revels in cruelty, that finds it fully acceptable to, at point-blank range, have a child blow the head off a man who has done nothing wrong, who is bound hand and foot. The children made to fight for the Islamic State join hundreds of thousands of others in the global fraternity of child soldiers. Hundreds of thousands of others. There are, on occasion, children brought in to fight for groups that are not Islamic. But they are the rare exception. Well over 90% and probably over 95% of children either lured or kidnapped to be murderers who are indoctrinated to kill are Muslims. They are fighting in places as diverse as India, Somalia, Thailand, and Thailand, the United Nations says, because the United Nations is trying to think that the diversity between them is what's important geographically as opposed to the only common denominator between them. They're being manipulated by Muslims using Islam. That's the common denominator, but the United Nations wasn't, doesn't want to consider the common denominator. They only want to consider the diversity and say, oh, you know, it's happening around the world. We can't point the finger at any one thing. The outside world has little to no access inside the self-described Islamic State. So proof of the terror group's use of child soldiers tends to come from propaganda and anecdotal evidence. That's not true. There are those who have escaped. There are those who tell us exactly what they endured. There are those who, are, who tell us that, that the boys themselves are initially whipped. 
and that at the cessation of whipping, they are allowed to study, they are told to study, they are compelled to study the Quran and Hadith of Muhammad. They spend most of their day studying the Quran and Hadith, and when they're studying the Quran and Hadith, they're not being whipped. When they are not studying it, they are being whipped. And then, once they are indoctrinated sufficiently with what is known about Muhammad and the formation of Islam and its terrorist nature, they are then sent out on a mission to kill a member of their own family. That is how they are prepared. And in some cases, where they don't have family to kill, where there's no nearby family, they just kill innocent individuals and torment others by whipping them. They're dehumanized in this process. It's impossible to say how many child soldiers the Islamic State has, but its recruitment and training operation is massive. This isn't a rare occurrence. There are hundreds of thousands of children prepared to be suicide bombers for Allah. The article says about six million people live in uh, Islamic State controlled territories. Uh, the, uh, the group itself estimates that it has as many as eight people under its uh, rule. As of uh, 2014, 33% of Syria's population was under the age of 14, according to the CIA uh, Word Factbook. In Iraq, the figure jumps to 37%. So it's, in this particular case, the Muslims will use anyone from about uh, eight or nine years old uh, up to, uh, to well, whatever age, but they'd be considered child soldiers from about, uh, let's say, 10 to 17 with with 14 being in the sweet spot of those that they will deploy. And when you get up to about uh, 17, uh, even 18, 19, 20, we're dealing with adolescents. That's uh, more than half of the population. A, a documentary, a, a, a documentary uh, film uh, released last year by Vice News included some of the first footage from an independent media outlet to show life inside of the Islamic State and the sheer number of kids that the terror group has uh, under its sway is stunning. The war won't end quickly if the Islamic State can readily replace its fallen soldiers with brainwashed children. It will be a matter of generations, he said, of how these young child jihadists will influence the Middle East. They will take maybe 20 years, 30 years. It's a long process, and it's a very dangerous one. Well, I can tell you exactly what's going to happen. That's why Yahweh told us when, you know, when the uh, Israelites first came into Israel, there were communities whose, whose rebellion, whose religious and political, militant, vicious, deceptive, destructive nature hadn't reached the point where there was no hope for them. And so uh, Yahweh had Abraham live uh, and coexist with them, with the exception of Sodom and Gomorrah, which it had boiled over to the point that their disgusting, depraved, and violent nature was was too dangerous for Abraham to even be around. And so Yahweh took care of them. But it wasn't until the children of Israel had spent 400 years as captive as slaves in the crucibles of human, religious, and political, military, and economic oppression in Egypt that the iniquity, the depravity of the peoples living in Israel had reached a point where it was overflowing, where nothing could be done, where there was no hope. And that same condition now exists throughout the Islamic world. No hope. Now, that's, is there a condition where there's absolutely hope for no Muslim anywhere in the world? No, I wouldn't go so far as to say that. But in an area of, that is controlled by fundamentalists, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, Syria, Iraq, Iran, 
Turkey. There is no hope. This, this has become a very dangerous situation. Now, Yahweh tells us exactly what's going to happen. He says, as a result of, of this religion of submission, that the violence and depravity that it uh, spreads is going to cause generation after generation of Muslims to sacrifice their own children to the killing machine. And they will continue to assault one another. They will continue to conduct war in uh, greater Syria until such time as the world surrenders to them, gives them what they want, which is the divestiture of Yisrael, and then they will use that invitation, as the Nazis used Neville Chamberlain's peace in our time, to flood into Israel in unstoppable numbers. They will all think they're doing a service to their God. That's what they will believe. They will be murderous. They will be ruthless. They will be perverted. And there is nothing that the world can do to stop this now. We could have, years ago. We could have insisted on telling people the truth about Islam. We could have insisted on quarantining the religion. We could have insisted and exposing and condemning this perverted doctrine that is so deadly, that is so sexually perverted, that is known to prey on children, particularly little girls and also little boys. We could have prevented its spread.